and welcome to the Face of Pro-Life. Today I'm speaking again with Darlene Wagner. Now in our last episode, we talked about an article that was written by Matt Abbott about the quiet euthanasia or the third way, way I'm sorry, which is um, basically dehydrating a dying patient before the um, patient is actually on the very uh, last uh, breath and um, basically before their, their, their time to die. And it's becoming a bigger and bigger epidemic in this country. And um, we wanted to talk a little bit more about how um, the new health care laws are going to uh, hasten the acceptance of this third way and how we can try to prevent it in our own um, family um, situations. So um, in the last episode, you talked about how your uh, mother-in-law had um, uh, initially been um, scheduled for death in the hospital because she had pneumonia and they were trying to dehydrate her. Um, when you took her home, I know you had a, uh, a, a relationship with hospice. Did you have any indication that they were um, heading toward, towards a third way with your, with your uh, mother-in-law? Uh, we didn't go into hospice until much later. Uh, I would spend the time and we would use her money to care for her at home. Uh, I was surprised to find out that Medicare almost, they'll give you almost nothing to care for your loved ones at home. Um, they'll send a bath aid uh, once a week and I don't think that, or once every third day, so we'll say that would be two times a, a week mm. for an hour, a bath aid. I didn't need that, right. and so uh, we just, we never used any of their services until um, toward the end when she started to have uh, reoccurring uh, bouts of uh, um, what they call, um, uh, uh, what was caused by the G-tube, uh, her getting pneumonia with the uh, aspiration pneumonia. Mm. And it's very common. It's it, it, it's it's hard to get rid of. It's when you get very congested and you can't dry the person out. And she and so toward the end, after all, she was 94, uh, and um, it, 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 I, we started to see it happen more often. And I, when I took her into the hospital, they gave me a really hard time. In fact, the doctor said, in effect, we don't want to see her back here. Wow. You know, uh, why don't you just let her go? And um, you know, she, you know, when you'd say, "Well, what? Why not put her on antibiotics?" and they'll say, "Well, she's just gonna, you know, Get it again. It, again." So why are you doing this? Well, gee, so, so if I take my kid in with an ear infection and they're gonna keep getting an ear infection, I shouldn't treat it. <laughs> but she, they're not 94. <laughs> Whenever her age would come up, it was always used almost like a weapon. Well, she's 94. You know, I mean, how long are you gonna keep her around? Uh, but the last time, he said he didn't want to see her back again. And, uh, and I was starting to wonder if, if the time does come, and she was dying, that I didn't want her there either. I didn't want her to die in, in that the hospital. hospital. <laughs> in any hospital, really. Yeah. But I, didn't, I, I wanted her to be at home. So um, as it turned out, she just passed away in her sleep. Uh, but we were starting her on antibiotics again, and that's exactly what I would have done. I would have gone right up to the very end caring for her. Um, and, uh, but God came and he took her. Mm -hmm. And that was God's will. Right. It wasn't the doctor's will. It wasn't, you know, anybody else not doing what they were supposed to do. I mean, I could have left her in the hospital and she probably would have died much sooner just by taking her home, probably gave her three or four days more. And the eyes of some people, they consider those three or four days that you're imposing pain on that person. I saw it, she was peaceful, she wasn't in pain. I think that if you have a pain situation, if you have a person who is experiencing pain, you need to deal with that and give them the relief that they need in a moderate level so that you don't cause premature death. Mm -hmm. But, um, I mean, it was a, she died in a natural way, 
and uh, high, we, she was hydrated, her mouth was clean, she was in clean sheets, she was loved, you know, we prayed over her, uh, you know, everything was done just right. But hospice, when I called them, when I found out that she had died that night, and I called them the next morning, we were supposed to have been in a hospice program, told, told me that because I didn't sign the papers to never take her back to the hospital, that we were not in hospice and that they would not come out and pronounce her. And so her, the, the, our home became a, uh, what they call, um, a crime scene. Lord. <laughs> and the, the police were sent out and, you know, cruisers and, and detectives and, and all that. <laughs> you know, to me it sounds like they're doing everything possible um, not to save money. I mean, r literally, it's having somebody at home, you know, being taken care of is going to save the state or the hospital or the medical system a ton of money because you're not paying all this money to the hospital for doing absolutely nothing but, you know, giving them uh, money. Um, and yet they make it sound like, make you feel like, you're a criminal because there's a, a dead person in your house who... Well, it had hospice followed through and what I thought was their policy. I thought that when we called hospice and because that was toward the end, remember this is the last two weeks of her life when there is every indication that yes, she might not make it and that she was at the end, um, that they insisted that we would sign an agreement that would say we would never take her back to the hospital. And I could not bring myself yeah. to sign that agreement. Yeah. Because I, I just don't know. You don't know, right. And I'm the I'm type of person who's a person of my word, and I wasn't going to sign something that I, that I wouldn't agree to. It wouldn't actually fall if I suddenly call the ambulance. I think some people do do that. They do sign those agreements and still end up calling, and they break the agreement. Um, but I didn't, so I didn't ever sign it. And because it wasn't on, in, in writing, they refused to come out and pronounce wow. uh, my mother-in-law, and therefore it became a crime scene. And I didn't know that until the very day that this happened. So hospice was, they were involved in this, they didn't go to the full hospice. It was just, some, they were coming for a couple hours a, a, a day, and we were moving into that end period where she preemptively passed away, in a, in, you know, through the hand of God. Mm -hmm. And um, thank him. And I thank God every day that, that she died that type of a graceful right. death. Um, and she didn't go through the hospice program where we're hearing about dehydration and everything. That's what I feared. Mm -hmm. I feared. I feared them starting to impose their, their rules on us and as we're reading and I'm hearing from friends and other people about what's going on in hospice I think it's it's alarming it it's, is. it's alarming that they should be there as loving caregivers to the end supportive caregivers to the family in the end but they should not be withholding anything uh, they shouldn't over they shouldn't over um, medicate so that you're totally you know incapacitated, incapacitated. They should, they should, they're skilled at this. They do know what they're doing, right. but they've chosen, they've chosen what, through their policies, this new policy of prematurely ending people's lives, it's, which is And it sounds skinny. like, um, I know in the article we read, this Ron Panzer, who is the director of Hospice Patients Alliance, you know, their organization is trying to uh, make sure that hospice sticks to its original um, promise, that's you know, right. it, it's it's which it, mo you and I all think that's that was their premise. But it sounds more and more that um, hospice is becoming a business, and as we saw with the Terry Shavo, um, they are willing to hasten death in in their patients. That that's not what they were their original. <laughs> well, they have plenty of business. This is where I think that they're looking True. at. So they're not looking as though if I keep this patient around. Uh, they're looking at next and next. And the government is now in partnership with them because a lot of the hospices uh, are run by a doctor who is very closely linked to, the, to a particular medical program, including maybe even a hospital. And that's in the case of Terry Shavo. There was a doctor who mm -hmm. was the one who was 
the one who was doing all this here decision making and the hospice and he owned the hospice he mm -hmm. was running the hospice so um, it's it becomes co-opted by the wrong people and, and we, we talked about a little bit about how you can see the writing on the wall as far as um, the Obamacare and um, the Sustanet in, in Connecticut where um, you know they have these these uh, mandates to save money, mm -hmm. and one of the easiest ways to save money is to hasten the you know the last throes of death. The most expensive right po portion of the care is in those last. That's when your 24-hour type care kicks in, where you really you know you no longer can just have let's say uh, an aid for for seven patients. That aid has to be right there when you're in, in end stages of life. So that means it gets very expensive. So the, the scary thing is, um, well, there's several scary things with that promise, is that, one, they're going to mark you for death, Pre and then prematurely, you know, uh, <laughs> hasten that, hasten that yeah. death. But what if you are um, mistakenly marked? It, it's going to happen. It's going to, it's going to happen. That, 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 we don't want to go there because that's what we're fighting right now. I think that when you um, have socialized medicine, that's going to happen. I, I just can't believe that. And then they're talking cost effective. Socialized medicine and cost effectiveness does not mean good care mm. for people. And certainly not for our elderly and not for our end of life care. Uh, it also can, may affect pre premature babies. The, you know, True. we haven't touched that yet, but it could very well go to that end of the oh, spectrum. Oh, yeah, because they're very expensive to uh, to keep around and uh, to give them care until they can survive on their own. So months there, and months. It's not going. It's not going to leave any any area untouched, except perhaps uh, areas that that we're still questioning how people are going to yeah. pay for all these expensive surgeries, like facial surgeries, and you know all these. Argument, you know, these additional. You know, <laughs> you know, how are they going to pay for that, and how is that going to fit into health care? Because it certainly is costly. Right. I, you know, the, the the thing that bothers me the most is that um, it, it seems like choice is being taken away. You know, See that word <laughs> choice. I know. You know, we always think. You know, the other side is always saying, you know, choice is such a good thing, but it sounds more and more that you know, is government exactly is government, and you know starts impinging and infringing on all of our um, areas of life, we have less and less choice, you know, because they want to treat everybody the same. And to me, I mean, crazy me, I don't want government in my health care at all. And what I would like is for all of the money that the government's stealing from me <laughs> as by way of taxes, as I could keep it and then give the money that I have instead to maybe Catholic hospitals and Catholic uh, organizations. I mean, it doesn't have to be Catholic. You know, other people have other denominations, but I really think our health care should come from the places that invented health care. You know, the Catholic Church was the first one to have hospitals. And, you know, that, that's where our health care should come from so that we do have a choice in that um, and allow the, the Catholic hospitals to minister in their their faith and not force them to give out plan B and not force them to um, use this third way or any other type of uh, the, euthanasia I I don't know why they couldn't just leave health care the way it was and then improve in in the certain particular areas that it need to be improved right on. they were minor compared to the major overhaul and the major overhaul will will lessen the quality care and then it will selectively pick out the areas where they can cut costs the quickest and the fastest and that will be with the end of life issues which is that's what makes us a civilized society right is that we care for our dying into the very end the very best the least of our we brothers. Can. What and we do for the least of our brothers. And and that's what made us a superior country. But that will that everyone is talking about that is going to be their first target. Yeah. And and the second issue is I don't understand why the elderly are the, at the end of the spectrum that are getting targeted for all the services to be cut. Uh, the dying and the elderly. 
when, on the other end of the spectrum, we've allowed uh, many people in our society to not work. They are entitlement programs that sometimes they need and sometimes they depend on too much. And uh, so at one end, they're spending vast sums of money, especially in drug rehabilitation programs are very costly. And at the other end, they're pointing out, oh, we have to cut Medicare. I don't understand it because I think the cost is greater at the end of the spectrum of the younger people than it actually mm -hmm. is at the end of the Medicare. And uh, 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 a person on Social Security is probably getting $1,200 uh, a month. That's probably the maximum amount of money that they're getting. Somebody on welfare is probably getting at least a thousand three hundred dollars if they have three or four dependents and then they have all these you know HUD housing they have food stamps they have heat assistance they have an endless array of entitlements and elderly people hardly use any of those entitlements. Who have worked their entire lives and so, paid so, into the system. So we have a totally you know uh, we have an imbalance in our society and yet every time you listen to the news they're talking about cutting the end of life cost in cutting Medicare. Yeah. And at the same time, there, we're, we're building more and more bureaucracy into the health care system, which, which costs more than anything, is <laughs> all of the, ben the benefits and the people that they're... Especially unionization. I know. That's what they're going to do. They're going to unionize everyone, and it's going to be $20 an hour. Yeah. You know that that's going to happen. Yeah, well, not only that, but the benefits and everything. We can't I'm not talking it. about, I'm talking about the lowest paid person yeah. at $20 an hour. I'm not talking about a doctor. But that means that even the person who mops the floors is going to end up being unionized. Yeah, yeah. And, and so they're really not cutting costs. Well, we might be cutting costs, but at the, the, the expense of our most vulnerable. Yes, because they will cut costs. They will go and find their cost-saving areas, and that will mean end of life. That will mean um, perhaps some type of specialized care for a senior citizen that you might need. It might be kidney transplants or a certain segment of society are only allowed to get kidney transplants. Yeah, or knee replacements or something simple like that, yeah. Absolutely. That it, You know it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to creep up every time they have to t make a cost they've, savings. They've, and they've shown this over and over again in other um, countries that have socialized medicine. And as soon as we passed Obamacare, the British are already saying that they're um, their health care system is a shambles and, it, and it's horrid and they want to reform it. And meanwhile, as soon as they're, you know, while he's saying this, our health care czar in the Obama administration is saying, we need to look at England and see what a great system they have. I mean, I they just admitted that their system's screwed up <laughs> and we're trying to emulate them. It, it's, it's so backwards. <laughs> so what, what can we do? Let's say, let's say, you know, you have right now, somebody who is is dying how do you make sure that that person is getting um, the care that they need so that God can use his will to to take their life rather than hasten it? well someone just told me the other day they were talking about their mother who had the, almost the same situation went to the hospital the doctor said she wasn't going to make it tonight and then they, they, you know, they went and they were praying with her and, and then they gave her a particular medication. And the next thing you know, the next morning she rallied around. She was sent off to therapy to, to be able to walk again because she was, was having problems walking and now she's home. I mean, this happens. And so you really need to pay attention when someone gets sick. You need to have your relatives, uh, if it means taking shifts, different people coming in, making sure she's getting care. If there is a particular medication that's going to help her, listen carefully, make sure that that's the right medication that she should be taking, and, uh, and pay attention and make sure that she's going to get follow-up care. I mean, don't, don't trust you know, come in and check at different times. Just your presence there puts the staff on notice that you care about this person and you don't want anything to happen to her. So I think the, 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 the key word is trust, is that you cannot trust the healthcare system anymore to take care of your loved ones. There's no advocate for your loved one in the hospital. Which no, seems so day. crazy. It doesn't matter how much you're paying either. It doesn't matter if you're a, you're a welfare recipient or if you're someone who has the best possible medical care, care uh, in that hospital. If your age 
if your age is going against you, they have a tendency to do less and less of the the things that are needed. So you to really need you an advocate. You need, you need to be the advocate. advocate. You need to have a, an advocate that's informed. Because sometimes if an advocate who, who goes there buys the first thing that they're told and they don't question things, um, then, you know, they go along with uh, with what could be, end up being, you know, the, the, the death spiral right. for their loved one. Um, so, you, you, you know, you need to consult certain people who you trust, um, use, you know, seek out intelligent and wise counsel and stay around and make sure everybody comes and goes from that room and uh, that they that you that you're paying attention to her their health her, their health concerns um, and then secondly if the person is dying make sure it's one that's with grace and dignity that they're well cared for and as they die um, that you have the appropriate spiritual environment mm -hmm. for them and um, that they're in a clean, you know, and uh, uh, given the appropriate, what they're going to have to have, you know, limited food, obviously, or what type of food, if it's, you know, by IV, but whatever, and given the appropriate medication that would take and away their pain, and water hydration is an important part. You don't overhydrate. We're not talking about you know saturating them and causing additional congestive heart failure. We're just talking about doing it as needed, when needed, appropriately, and and for myself, it would in prayers, very important. You know asking everybody to pray for that person mm -hmm. and I do believe in spiritual a spiritual death that mm -hmm. where I've seen people die in almost no pain with no medication you know you can I, I believe God does send his angels and and, and, and death yes, can be can. extremely uh, a, a, a very very graceful a very respectful uh, time and you accept God's will but you didn't cause it because you didn't take good care of that person, and you didn't cause it because you, you hastened their death. You did it in concert with God's, God's call for them. What are some of the things that you might want to look out for, be warned of? I mean, how, how do you know that um, the patient's being dehydrated? Well, the first thing is, I, you know, I Unless know. Unless you're there all the time. An I and O should be, you should ask that an I and O be put on your family members. And if they refuse, you want to know why they're refusing an I and O. But I and O, I noticed that. That was the first thing that struck me. What's strange. an I and O? Uh, intake and output, you know. Ah. So, um, so, so they're measuring how, how much yes, fluid the person is taking in and how much they're, they're putting out. Putting out. <laughs> right. And that's when you know that if more goes in that comes out, that means that they're filling up. And, um, and you can also tell, obviously, through the physical examination. Right. So that's telling, that's telling you both that they're well hydrated mm -hmm. and or if the system is or that if the staff is doing coming it. down. <laughs> if, if staff is taking care of it, then you know in, uh, everybody can fudge you know, what they put uh, on, on something, but th pretty much can tell you. You know, the, did the staff come in? Did they reposition this person? Right. Did they give them hydration? Did they give them nutrition? If they're not taking it at all, how long, how many days has it been that they haven't taken nutrition? Uh, and usually it's, you know, or if it's through an IV, how, how much of the IV went in? You know, and they, they reduce the drip, you know that, for, uh, for elderly people. And that's the reason why sometimes it can't sustain them. If your if your drip is too low, and that's why uh, a feeding tube needed to be in, in, put into Eloise because the drip was causing not her sufficient. was not sufficient for her to be hydrated, and and we only had approximately one day to make that decision, wow. you know, and that's why when but a, you would have you could have found out just by looking at her output that her her input wasn't good her mouth her mouth. her mouth that's the okay. first thing the, the skin. The mouth, you look in the mouth and you can see that it's crusted over, you know, and uh, and then you ask, well, what did she drink, you know, and then they're supposed to be listing it. If they're not listing it, no, well, we don't know. Well, you should be suspicious immediately. Mm -hmm. You should demand, you know, when somebody's telling you that something's that serious uh, and that death is pending, that you want to have an I and O on your family member. 
And if they can't take anything, then how many days is it going to be before they die? And what can I do to alter this? I mean, is this? I mean, is there is there uh, uh, antibiotics? Is there uh, you know a G tube? And in case in our case, it was a G tube that mm -hmm. saved her life, and it turned it around for her. And um, and it depends. I mean, it, for us, it meant a great deal that she would live a year and a half more. Of course. You know, and and I and I, if it was up to me, I would have kept her going for a hundred years. You know, I mean that that's I know, and and she was a lot of trouble too. I mean, <laughs> she wasn't quiet. She <laughs> it was a lot of work to take care of her. So, um, or any person who is a loved one at that in mm -hmm. that condition is going to be a lot of work. I know that. You know, I. Uh, but that's the challenge of of life. Are there any loving. other other um, warning signs like? Um, as far as a sedation, or they, I know in the article it said we really shouldn't be sedating somebody unless they're like really a danger to themselves or somebody else. That's a real problem even in home care, especially when the family's taking care of them. I've noticed that the minute they make so much as one moan, somebody will go and they'll give them uh, morphine. And you usually have morphine all over the place in mm -hmm. home care uh, for, uh, you know, it goes by way. You know, by different methods, they'll yeah. have it because the big thing is the doctor said that they're dying. They don't want their loved one to suffer, and so there's a lot of over medication, and um, and I think that that's something that people should come to understand and be educated about. And I don't think that there's a great deal going on about that, but uh, because I know it's important to stay um, very, you know, for those of us who who believe the spiritual mm -hmm. aspect of dying is important. You need to be lucid yeah. in order to make... Yeah, you need to keep them in that state of grace so that they can um, make their peace with with God and, and, and each other. Right. And, and, you know, this can be a beautiful time of your life, you know? You don't have to work. You don't have to <laughs> make a bed. You don't have to watch do oh, the laundry. Oh, somebody might have else. a real <laughs> problem with your, your analogy there. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, I don't mean it that way. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a time you've lived a long, you know, in most cases people have lived a long time. Or in the case of a chronic illness, um, they've, they've gone through a great deal. And in preparation, spiritually, they should be prepared. Right. And all of us will go through that. I mean, I had a ca catastrophic illness that I had to recognize that I right. could die, and I had to make my peace too. And you know, I'm not I'm not gone yet, but, <laughs> but I think all of us have to go that course to know that we have a beginning and end to our life. And 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 I that's that's the it's not easy. I mean, I'm not saying it's easy, but it, it is an important um, art form right. of the grace to die. Right. You know, and and a great spiritual. Uh, gift and that's the true dignity in death yes thank you so much yeah. for joining us you've been very inf informative uh, thank you for joining us today we hope that you've learned something uh, we hope that you talk to your family and friends about the things you have learned and when you uh, look in the mirror the next time we hope you realize yours too is the face of pro-life please join us next time